Hello and welcome to my speed run presentation for Edexcel GCSE Combined Science Chemistry Paper 3. This goes through the entire content very quickly uh, in not much detail and is designed to give you a quick top up just before the exam and should not be the main part of your revision. Chapter 1 to 2 covers states of matter and separating mixtures. In terms of basic definitions, atoms are the smallest stable particle of matter. Molecules are particles made of two or more atoms bonded together. Elements are substances made from only one type of atom. Compounds are substances made of two or more types of atom bonded together. And mixtures are made from two or more different substances, elements or compounds that are mixed together but not bonded. States of matter. Solids have particles that are touching and are arranged in regular rows and the particles are just vibrating around a fixed point. In a liquid, the particles are touching and they're also moving and are in a random arrangement. In a gas, the particles are not touching, they're moving very quickly and the arrangement is random. State changes. So solid to liquid is called melting. Liquid back to solid is called freezing. Liquid to gas is called evaporation or boiling. Gas back to liquid is called condensation. Solid straight to gas is called sublimation. Gas back to solid is called deposition. If you graph the temperature changes as you heat something, you get a steady increase in temperature, but with these two flat sections, the first flat section is melting. The second flat section is boiling. Solubility. So a soluble substance is one that dissolves, an insoluble one is one that does not dissolve. The liquid that does the dissolving is called the solvent, the, the substance that gets dissolved is called the solute, and the mixture you make when the solute is dissolved in the solvent is called a solution. Filtration is used to separate an insoluble solid from a liquid. The idea is that you pour things through a filter paper. The filter paper has tiny holes that allow the liquid through but catches the solid. Crystallisation is used to collect the solid that is dissolved in a liquid. The idea is you put the solution in an evaporating basin, heat it indirectly uh, on a beaker of boiling water. When the uh, solution is reduced by about half, you then leave it in a warm place to dry over a few days. Distillation is used to collect the liquid from a solution. You boil the liquid and you pass it through a condenser. The condenser has a cold surface to condense the vapours back to a liquid. You collect droplets of the liquid as shown there. Fractional distillation collects liquids from a mixture of two or more liquids and it has this fractionating column that allows a better division between the liquids. If you look at the thermometer, each time a new liquid boils, the temperature of the thermometer changes to the boiling point of that particular liquid. Again, we have the condenser and you collect the different fractions here and you change your um, beaker over your flask over each time the temperature changes on the thermometer. Paper chromatography is used to separate liquids on a small scale. You start with a stationary phase, normally a piece of chromatography paper. You draw a pencil line on that piece of paper and then you place a spot of your sample on there. You put the piece of chromatography paper in some solvent and the solvent soaks up the paper, um, separating out the different substances in the sample as it does so. The most soluble ones go furthest, the least soluble ones go least far. Um, you can calculate RF, which is the distance moved by the compound, divided by the distance moved by the solvent. The first part of the investigating ink core practical involved distillation of ink. We had a boiling tube with some ink in the bottom and we heated it with a Bunsen burner. The vapours produced by that were passed out of a delivery tube into a second boiling tube that was sat in an ice bath. The ice bath produced a cold surface for the vapours to condense on so it collects our liquid in the bottom of that boiling tube. We also did ink chromatography where we took uh, a piece of chromatography paper, we drew a pencil line on it and placed some spots of different inks on the pencil line. Then we placed the, pen the uh, chromatography paper in some water with the water coming below the level of the pencil line and the inks rose up the paper as the water soaked up the paper and separated out the different colours. We then measured the distances and calculated the RF for each one. Topics three to four, atomic structure and the periodic table. Atoms are the smallest stable particle of matter. They're made of subatomic particles. Um, protons, which have a massive one, a charge of plus one, are found in the nucleus and are given by the atomic number. Neutrons have a massive one, a charge of zero, are also found in the nucleus and are given by the atomic mass take away the atomic number. And lastly, we've got electrons have a mass of 1 over 1835, a charge of minus 1. They're found in shells around the atom, around the nucleus, and they are also given by the atomic number. Here we can see that structure with the nucleus in the middle and the electrons in shells around it. The periodic table uh, is arranged in groups and periods. Groups are the columns, so 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And periods are the rows, 1, 2, 3 and so on. Note that hydrogen does not belong in any group. The 
periodic table can help us to determine the structure of atoms. There are two numbers on each element, the atomic mass at the top and the atomic number at the bottom. The atomic number tells us the number of protons and the number of electrons. So for beryllium here, that is four. Um, the atomic mass uh, tells us the number of neutrons. If we do atomic mass, take away the atomic number. So nine minus four gives us five neutrons. Electron configuration tells us how the electrons are arranged around an atom. They're arranged in shells. The first shell can hold two electrons, the second one eight, and the third one also eight. So in the case of lithium here, it has three electrons in total, two in the first shell, one in the second shell, and we can write that as 2.1. Chlorine here has 17 electrons in total, so two in the first shell, eight in the next shell, and seven in the final shell. We can write that as 2.8.7. The group number tells us the number of electrons in the outer shell. So lithium's in group one, has one electron in the outer shell. Chlorine's in group seven, has seven electrons in its outer shell. The period number tells you the number of shells. So lithium is in period two, so it has two shells. Uh, chlorine is in period three, so it has three shells. Isotopes are different versions of an element with the same atomic number, but a different atomic mass. That is the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. Carbon has three isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. If we look at their symbols, they've all got the same atomic number, but they've got different atomic masses. So this atomic number is the same, which means they've all got six protons and six electrons. But to find out the neutrons, we do 12 minus 6 makes six neutrons for carbon-12. 13 minus 6 is seven neutrons for carbon-13. And 14 minus 6 is eight neutrons for carbon-14. Topics five to seven on bonding and structure. Now, ionic bonds form when a positive ion is attracted to a negative ion. Ions are atoms with a positive or negative charge. You get cations, which are positive ones formed by losing electrons, and it is metals that form those. Anions are negative ions formed by gaining electrons, and that is done by non-metals. So an ionic bond then is the electrostatic attraction between a positive and a negative ion. To form ionic bonds, electrons are transferred from a metal atom to a non-metal atom. You can see that happening here. Lithium is losing its outer shell electron and giving it to fluorine. That has filled up fluorine's outer shell, creating a negative fluorine ion and a positive lithium, which are attracted to each other, forming an ionic bond. Ionic compounds form what is called a lattice structure. That's shown here. That is a three-dimensional repeating pattern of ions uh, alternating positive, negative, positive, negative. They have a high melting point because melting requires you to break strong electrostatic forces, which takes a lot of heat energy. They do not conduct electricity when they are solid because the ions cannot move. But if you melt them or dissolve them, they do conduct electricity because the ions become free to move. Covalent bonding involves sharing electrons. Um, and you can see that here in this diagram of hydrogen, that shared pair of electrons in the middle there, that is a covalent bond. You need to memorize these diagrams for hydrogen, hydrogen chloride, oxygen, carbon dioxide and methane. If you cannot remember the diagram, at least draw a few overlapping circles with some pairs of electrons in the overlapping bits. And that's quite likely to get you a mark. Some covalent compounds form simple molecular structures uh, made of molecules. A molecule is a particle made of a few atoms bonded covalently together. So that there is a water molecule made of three atoms bonded together. They have low melting points because the neighbouring molecules are held together by these weak intermolecular forces. That does not take much energy to break them, so they have a low melting point. They do not conduct electricity because they have no electrons that are free to move. Other covalent compounds form giant molecular structures with a repeating three-dimensional pattern of atoms joined by covalent bonds. For example, silicon dioxide, diamond, graphite. This here is an example of silicon dioxide where every carbon atom is joined to four oxygens and every oxygen atom is joined to two carbons. And that pattern just repeats many times in each direction. They have a high melting point because melting requires you to break strong covalent bonds and they do not conduct electricity because they have no electrons free to move except for graphite, which is the exception. A polymer is a large molecule made from many smaller ones joined together. We call those small molecules monomers. You can see monomers in green here. Uh, and here you can see the way all those small monomers have joined together to make our big polymer molecule. Important examples in nature are proteins, which are made from amino acids joined together, and starch, which is made from glucose monomers joined together. Metallic bonding involves delocalized electrons. A delocalized electron is one that rather than just spending its life orbiting one atom is actually free to go on a journey between all of the atoms around it. It just wanders wherever it likes to go. Okay, So that leaves the metal atoms as ions.
because they've lost their outer shell electrons. So the ion the metallic bond is the attraction between the lattice of positive metal ions and the cloud of delocalized electrons. Because the electrons are free to move, they conduct electricity. You can see here the electrons going from negative to positive because they're free to move. Topic eight is about acids and alkalis. The pH scale tells us whether something is acid or alkali. So zero to six is acid, seven is neutral, and eight to 14 is alkali. And we can tell whether something is acid or alkali using indicators. Uh, for example, litmus indicator, which is red in acid and blue in alkali. Methyl orange, which is orangey red in acid and yellow in alkali. And phenolphthalein, which is colorless in acid and bright pink in alkali. Universal indicator has a range of color changes going from red for strong acid to orange for medium acid, uh, yellow for weak acid, green for neutral. Um, uh, blue for sort of pH 9 and then purple for strong alkali. We can measure pH more accurately using a pH meter like this which gives a digital readout to, to one or two decimal places. Acids, bases and salts. So an acid is a solution that has a pH of less than 7. There are three we need to know. So furic acid which makes sulfate salts has the formula H2SO4. We need to know nitric acid, which makes nitrate salts, has the formula HNO3. And hydrochloric acid, which makes chloride salts, has the formula HCl. Um, a base is a substance that neutralizes an acid to make a salt and water. And there are three types we need to know about. Metal hydroxides, which have the formula MOH. Metal oxides, which have the formula MO. And metal carbonates, which have the formula M. CO3. In all of these cases, M just stands for any old metal. A salt is a compound produced when an acid is neutralized by a base. For example, sodium chloride, copper nitrate, uh, calcium sulfate. Notice the names of these here. The second part of the name tell you the acid you've come from, and the first part of the name tells you the metal that was involved in the base. Reactions of acids. So acids react with metal hydroxides to make a salt and water. For example, sodium hydroxide and nitric acid make sodium nitrate and water. There's our nitrate salt from nitric acid. Um, metal oxides react in the same way with acid to make, again, a salt and water. For example, magnesium oxide and sulfuric acid making magnesium sulfate and water. This is our salt here. And notice because it's sulfuric acid, it makes a sulfate. And finally, with metal carbonates, acids react to make a salt and water and carbon dioxide too. So we get bubbles of gas produced. Um, for example, calcium carbonate and hydrochloric acid makes calcium chloride and water and carbon dioxide. Again, notice calcium chloride is our salt, chloride because it is hydrochloric acid. Core practical to prepare copper sulfate involves reacting copper oxide and sulfuric acid together to make copper sulfate and water. So we heated some acid without boiling it. Then we added a spatula of copper oxide and stirred it until it dissolves to make a nice blue solution. Then we repeated these two steps again and again until the acid stopped dissolving and it went black and cloudy. Then we filtered it to remove the undissolved copper oxide, which was making it black and cloudy, to get a nice blue solution. We poured that solution into an evaporating basin. We heated the evaporating basin over a beaker of hot water. And when the solution reduced by about half, we left it in a warm place to evaporate to leave the crystals to form over a few days. The second core practical on this topic was investigating how the pH changes as you add a base to an acid. So we put 50 centimetres cubed of hydrochloric acid in a beaker. We measured the pH using universal indicator paper. It came out to around pH 0 or pH 1. Um, and then we added 0.3 grams of calcium hydroxide, which is a base, and stirred to dissolve. This increased the pH and we retested that pH with more universal indicator paper. We repeated this seven times to add a total of 2.4 grams of calcium hydroxide. And then we produced a graph showing the pH versus the amount of base added and we got a graph that was shaped like this where it starts off flat has this very steep section in the middle around the neutralization point and then it flattens off again at the end a precipitation reaction is one in which mixing two solutions of soluble salts produces an insoluble one and you will know a precipitation reaction because it goes cloudy for example you can see here we've got this color solution there color solution here mixed together makes this yellow cloudiness okay this is the example of potassium iodide and lead nitrate making lead iodide which is that cloudy yellow precipitate and potassium nitrate topics 10 to 12 were on electrolysis metals and reversible reactions so electrolysis is using direct current to break down ionic compounds into the elements they're made from now some key language we have an electrolyte 
that is made from an ionic compound in a liquid form so it's either dissolved or melted and that is what gets electrolyzed we have electrodes which are the conducting materials that we stick into the electrolyte to carry the electric current and we have two of those we have a cathode which is the negative one so the cathode is here that's negative um, and at the cathode cations positive ions go to the cathode and they get discharged by gaining electrons and that produces metal the anode is the positive electrode and it attracts negative ions anions they go there and get discharged by losing electrons to produce non-metals normally in the form of gas the core practical on this was to investigate how the rate of electrolysis is affected by the current. So we set up some uh, an electrolytic cell with copper electrodes and copper sulfate electrolyte, and we can see that here. And we had it connected to a power supply, and we also had a variable resistor in there. That's the symbol for variable resistor. Um, now, we cleaned away each electrode and attached it to a DC power supply, and we used the variable resistor to adjust the current to 0.1 amps, and we left it for 15 minutes. Then we cleaned it and reweighed each electrode, and what we found was that the anode lost mass and the cathode gained mass. What we then did was we repeated the experiment four or five times, adjusting the current to different levels, so 0.2 amps, 0.3 amps, and so on. And what we found was that the greater the current, the greater the decrease in mass of the anode and the greater the increase in mass of the cathode. Reactivity tells us how many reactions an element does and how quickly it does them. The most reactive elements up here are potassium, sodium and calcium, and they will react just with cold water. The next most reactive ones are magnesium, aluminium, zinc and iron. They will react with water, but it has to be hot water, water vapour in the form of steam. And lastly, with the least reactive metals, we have our copper, silver and gold. They do not react with water at all. Now, you'll notice on the reactivity series here, we've got two things that aren't metals. We've got carbon and hydrogen. You still need to know their place, even though they're not metals. Displacement reactions are ones in which a more reactive metal displaces a less reactive metal from a compound for example copper sulfate and zinc will make zinc sulfate and copper this is because zinc is higher up the reactivity series than copper so zinc can displace copper however the reverse reaction here does not take place because zinc is more reactive than copper so copper cannot displace it Redox reactions are ones involving oxidation and reduction. Oxidation is when a element or compound gains oxygen and reduction is when it loses oxygen. A good example of oxidation is rusting, which involves iron and oxygen reacting together to make iron oxide. A good example of reduction is how we extract metals from their compounds. So, for example, to get aluminium, we reduce aluminium oxide into aluminium and oxygen is the aluminium that then we can use. A redox reaction is one where reduction and oxidation happen at the same time. Metals are not found naturally in their raw state, but are found in rocks called ores, which contain compounds of the metal. The only metals that are found in their pure state are really silver and gold down here. Now, we can extract metals by heating them with carbon. This only works with metals that are less reactive than carbon, and that is both a displacement reaction and a redox reaction. So, for example, iron oxide and carbon makes carbon dioxide and iron. The iron oxide is being reduced, the carbon dioxide is being oxidized. So, that is a, a redox reaction. Also, you can say the carbon has displaced the iron because carbon is more reactive than it. Metals that are more reactive than carbon cannot be extracted by heating with it. So for that, we use electrolysis. For example, aluminium oxide has to be electrolyzed to convert it to aluminium and oxygen. And that is done in a very big electrolytic cell like this, where we have to melt the aluminium oxide using lots of energy first. Reversible reactions are ones that can go backwards as well as forwards. And when the backwards rate and the forwards rate reach the same speed, we say that they've reached dynamic equilibrium, where the concentrations of reactants and products stop changing. An example of this is the way that nitrogen and hydrogen can form ammonia. And we see the forwards reaction is nitrogen and hydrogen making ammonia, but the ammonia gets involved in the backwards reaction where it turns back into nitrogen and hydrogen. Notice the symbol used here, that double-headed arrow thing. Um, the harbour process is used to make ammonia and it takes advantage of what we know about dynamic equilibrium. So it has a high pressure to make more product, a high catalyst to make it faster, and a high temperature to make it faster. Topic nine, mass
The relative formula mass of a compound is calculated by adding together the masses of all of the uh, atoms that are in it. So, for example, with magnesium nitrate, it contains one magnesium atom. So we're going to have one times mg. It contains two nitrogen. So we're going to add two times n. And it contains six oxygen. So we're going to have six times O. We need to use the atomic masses for each one. So magnesium is 24. So one times 24 added to 14 for nitrogen, so 2 times 14. And for oxygen, it is 16, so we're going to have 6 times 16. And if we add all that together, we get a relative uh, formula mass of 148. An empirical formula is a molecular formula expressed as a ratio in its lowest terms. So to do this, we need to find the highest common factor of the numbers in a formula. In this first one, highest common factor of 2 and 4 is 2. So if you divide both of those numbers by 2, we end up with an empirical form of NH2, because 2 divided by 2 is 1, 4 divided by 2 is 2. Here, the highest common factor is of 6, 12 and 6 is 6. So divide each of these numbers by 6, we end up with CH2O. 6 divided by 6 is 1, 12 divided by 6 is 2, 6 divided by 6 is 1. Sometimes the empirical formula and the molecular formula are the same, and you know that if the highest common factor is 1, highest common factor here is 1, so the empirical formula is just going to be H2SO4. To calculate the percentage composition by mass of an element in a compound, for example, the percentage of iron in iron oxide, we need to work out the total amount of the compound, the element in a compound, and divide that by the relative mass of the compound itself. So, for example, the percentage of iron here okay, is going to be, um, work out the total mass of iron, so that is 2 times 56, because 56 is the mass of iron. We're going to need to divide that by the MR of iron oxide, so the MR of iron oxide is going to be 2 times iron plus 3 times oxygen, so that is 2 times 56 plus 3 times 16, and that comes to 160. So we're going to divide this 2 times 56 by 160 and times it by 100 to make percent, and if we do that, we get 70%. To determine an empirical formula from experiments and data, first we'll write down the symbols we've got as, an, uh, as a ratio. So we've got carbon and hydrogen, so we're going to have C dot dot H. Then write in the data we've got. So for carbon, we've got 1.5 grams. For hydrogen, it doesn't tell us, but it says the total mass is 2. So the mass must be 1 point, uh, 2 minus 1.5 to give us 0 0.5 grams of that. Then we divide each of those answers by the relative atomic mass of the um, element. So carbon, we divide by 12. Hydrogen, we divide by 1. That gives us 0.125 for carbon and 0.5 for hydrogen. Then what we do is we divide both of those by the smallest of those answers. So divide that by 0.125 and divide this by 0.125. And we get uh, 1 for carbon and 4 for hydrogen. So that tells us that the empirical formula here is CH4. To determine the masses of chemicals involved in a reaction. First of all, we start by writing out the relevant information from the question uh, underneath the things in the formula. So, um, for example, it says what mass of water It's asking what mass of water. So we don't know the mass. We're going to call it X because it is unknown. It can be made from 64 grams of oxygen. So we're going to put 64 underneath oxygen. OK, then it says calculate the MR of each of the relevant things uh, and multiply the MR by the coefficient of them in the equation. So we're going to have one times the MR of O2. OK. So that is going to equal 1 times 2 lots of 16, because 16 is the relative atomic mass of oxygen. So we end up with uh, 32 is our final answer there. Okay. Uh, and for water, we're going to have 2 lots of the MR of H2O. Okay. So that's going to be 2 times 2 times 1 for hydrogen and 1 times 16 for the oxygen. So that is going to come to 2 times that bracket, which gives us... 36. From this, we can construct two fractions that are equal to each other using the top and bottom number there. So 64 over 32 is going to be equal to x over 36. Okay, That rearranges to this. So we can say if we can put the 36 up there, we end up with x equals 64 over 32 times by 36. And if we work that all out, that comes to an answer of 72 grams. To find the quantity in moles of a chemical compound, we're going to use the equation moles equals mass 
over molar mass. Okay. Uh, in this question, we've got 69 grams of ethanol. So the mass is that 69 grams. The molar mass we need to work out, but that is just the relative formula mass with a G on the end for grams. So if we calculate the relative formula mass here, we're going to say MR of C2, C2H5OH. So it's going to be two times carbon plus six times hydrogen plus one times oxygen. So that is two times 12 plus six times one plus one times 16. And that comes to 46 in total. So then we're going to have 69 divided by 46. And that comes to 1.5 mole as our final answer. Thank you for listening. The end.